Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on breeding for, for production system efficiency. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Camilleroy people, and to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm Naomi Hobson, a Senior Livestock Officer with the Northwest Local Land Services based out at Narrabri, and we also have our other Livestock Officer online, Kate McCarthy, who is based on the Liverpool Plains, as well as our guest presenter, Katrina Millen. The webinar today has been brought to you by the Northwest Beef Extension Network, which is an initiative of the Northwest LLS Livestock Team. The aim of the Beef Extension Network is to help producers get the best from their beef business. We hope to improve your access to resources and research relating to beef cattle nutrition, genetics, grazing management, as well as showcasing technologies and tools that, you, that can help you better manage and track productivity and profit drivers within your business. A key part of this network is, for, is also for us to have direct communication with you so that we can make sure, firstly, that you don't miss out on hearing about events like this, but also so that you can let us know what topics or information you'd like us to cover that will be timely and relevant to your production system and season. If you haven't already, you can sign up to be part of the network by completing a short online form. And you can access this form by either clicking on the logo image on this screen at the moment, or by opening your phone camera and hovering it over the QR code in the bottom right hand corner. We'll also send a link to the form via email with a recording of the webinar after we're finished today, or you can just get in touch with Kate and myself and we'd be more than happy to help you register. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. To reduce background noise, your microphones have automatically been muted. Katrina will answer your questions at the end of her presentation and you can send your questions through at any point in the presentation via the chat bar. For those of you that haven't used GoToWebinar platform before, you can find the chat function at the bottom of the taskbar on the right. And I've got it circled here for you to see where it is. You just type your message into the bottom, hit enter, and your chat question will come through to us. We have a couple of poll questions, which we will do next. And there is another two at the end of the webinar. So please stay online for an extra couple of minutes to answer these for us. We know feedback can be tedious, but we have kept them short and sweet. And your feedback is really important for our program planning. And when we're trying to pitch ideas for future events. So I'll just go over and open up the poll question now. And that should be on your screen. So the first question is, where are you listening in from today? You can see your responses are coming in there. So we'll just give it a couple of seconds. And three, two, one, and we'll close that poll. And we can see that the bulk of you are coming from New South Wales and also some from out of state, which is fantastic. So we have another poll question now, which is what is your role within the beef industry? Um, so commercial breeder, a stud breeder, agribusiness professional or an advisor or other, and you can select more than one answer here. Okay, so we close that poll in three, two, one. And I can see that the bulk of you online with us today, commercial breeders, some stud breeders, and it's really good to see some agribusiness professionals as well. And now the last poll question before we get started is a simple one. How would you rate your current knowledge of EBVs? Excellent, good, average, minimal, or you haven't had any experience with EBVs? And we'll close the poll in three, two, one. Um, and it looks like we've got a bit of a spread there. The bulk of you are good, average and minimal. So hopefully after Katrina's presentation, um, we'll be able to see that jump a little bit as well today. Um, I'll hand over to Katrina now. Katrina Millen is a technical officer with Southern Beef Technology Services, a joint initiative of Meat and Livestock Australia, the Agricultural Business Research Institute and 13 Breed Societies. SBTS provides the Southern Australian beef industry with extension services and technical support to maximise understanding and use of genetic te technologies, including breed plan. Katrina holds a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Agricultural Science with Honours and has been with SBTS since 2015 based up at Armidale. We're really pleased to have Katrina with us today to discuss the ways in which beef producers can use genetics to select animals for improved production system efficiency. This presentation will cover efficiency from biological, economic and 
environmental perspective while also highlighting the genetic traits that are important for efficiency of the breeding cow versus her progeny. So I'll just switch over to Katrina's screen um, and let her take it away. Thanks, Naomi. So uh, when we first started discussing the idea um, for a Breeding for Efficiency webinar, it was in the context of drought. So like many areas in New South Wales, Armidale had a pretty severe drought last year. This is a photo I took out of a plane um, in November and it was our driest year on record where we had 39% of our average annual rainfall, like many areas of, of New South Wales. And I guess then what happened was we got some rain in late December and we then followed that with our wettest summer for 23 years. And we had more rain in January and February than we did um, in the, the whole of 2019 put together. And so just as we're, we're going through and we're thinking about um, breeding for efficiency, I guess I wanted to um, get you guys to think about that in the context of a rebuild. And so while dams are filling and the paddocks are green, it's really important that we remember what we learnt during the drought and think about the opportunities that this herd rebuilding phase that we're in right now op offers us with um, things to think about, including the breeding direction you want to set for your future herd. So this is an opportunity as you're outsourcing new, new cows, new bulls, um, to think about which, which direction you want to take that herd into the future and whether or not there's changes to the market endpoints that you want to target. So I won't talk too much about rebuilding as we go through this, but just keep that in mind as we go through what is production system efficiency. So this is our profit equation. And we know that profit on farm is the number of calves with as well as the weight and the quality less the cost of production. So we can influence all of these traits with genetics. There's certainly some environmental factors as well and how you manage your, your property will have an impact on your profit equation, but so does the genetics. And I could sit here and talk about how fertility and calving ease is important for number of calves and the weight or the growth of the animal is important and our carcass traits as well as our, our feed efficiency traits. But what I wanted to do for this webinar was take us through um, the efficiency of a self-replacing herd. And when we look at self-replacing herds, they can really be broken into a breeding herd and then the sale and slaughter progeny. So what I'm gonna do now is go through what, what makes a breeding herd efficient and what makes the sale and slaughter progeny efficient. So if we think about efficiency in the breeding herd, what we want a cow to do is to get in calf, preferably in that first or second cycle, and carry the calf to term. Secondly, she needs to give birth to a live calf without assistance. She then needs to wean that calf, and then she needs to go back, repeat that cycle, and get back in calf to give you a calf next year. And really, what she should do is do all of this without consuming excessive amounts of feed. So your maintenance, cost, maintenance costs on that cow shouldn't be high. So if we look at each of those um, one by one, getting in calf is our fertility traits. And the advantages of getting your, your heifers and cows pregnant in the first or second cycle is that it gives you a shorter joining period which gives you a shorter calving down period, which means there's less time that you need to be out in the paddock checking those cows and those heifers during calving. And then because they're, they're born um, earlier than if you had late born calves, they have an age and weight advantage because that means that they've got more time to grow until you're ready to market them. So failure to get pregnant for a heifer or cow is often due to the heifer not being sexually mature. So um, when we think about our heifers, there's usually two reasons for this. Either she's a late maturing type, so she's later maturing, not yet sexually um, mature when you put the bull out with her, or she's born late in the season. So she's not actually old enough when we get round to joining to be joined because she was born late and hasn't had a time had the chance to, to grow up to maturity. So we've got two breed plan fertility EBVs that can assist producers with improving their fertility traits. 
The first of these is days to calving and it's our female fertility trait. Um, and if we have a look at the diagram on the, the bottom of the screen, what, what days to calving is, is from the bull in or the mating date through to when the calf is born. And we find that most of the variation in this trait is not um, to do with the gestation length, that's fairly fixed. Most of the variation that we see between these females is from when the bull goes in to conception. And so whether or not it takes them one, two, three cycles, et cetera, to get pregnant. And that's what this, this trait's really picking up is, did she get pregnant early? Did she get pregnant late? Or did she not get pregnant at all? And so because it's the time taken for days to calving, when you're looking at at the EBVs, you want to go for a more negative EBV because that says to you she's going to take a shorter time to get pregnant until the subsequent calf is born. A second fertility EBV that can help with the fertility traits in our female herd is scrotal size. Now that sounds a little bit counterintuitive because females don't have scrotals, but what we know is that scrotal size is associated with early maturity in males and females. And so a bull that's got a more positive scrotal size EBV is likely to have daughters that reach maturity earlier than a bull with a more negative scrotal size EBV. And so um, we can also use scrotal size along with our days to calving to think about the maturity um, pattern of our, our females and of that bull's daughters and use it to help improve the fertility in the herd. Now the second thing we want our cow to do is to give birth to a live calf. And this is our calving traits. So we know that calving difficulties have a negative impact on profitability in a number of ways. They are associated with increased calf and heifer mortality, and in some cases, even with cow mortality. Um, also slower rebreeding performance and potentially very costly additional labor and vet expenses if you have to get vets out to um, do caesareans. So we've got a couple of calving traits that breed plan produces that can help um, to improve the calving ease of your female herd. Um, the first of these are our calving ease traits and both of these are the likelihood of calving difficulties in two-year-old heifers. So the first um, calving ease EBV is calving ease direct. Now this is important for all herds. Um, self-replacing herds, but also in terminal herds, because what this EBV is describing is the likelihood of a sire's calves being born unassisted from two-year-old heifers. So that's, that's going to be of interest to everyone, no matter what production system you're running. And the calving ease daughters, this is really only applicable for those of you that are in self-replacing herds and are keeping female progeny. This one is the likelihood of a sire's two-year-old daughters calving unassisted. And so it's about how well will that sire's daughters calve when they're having their own calves. And in both cases, we want more, uh, more calving ease, less calving difficulty. And so we're looking for more positive calving ease EBVs for both of these traits. Our second trait that can assist with um, the cow's ability to give birth to a live calf is our gestation length trait. So that's the time from conception to calving and we want shorter gestation lengths and so more negative EBVs are what we're looking for here. And the third one is birth weight. So that's obviously the, the weight of the calf as it's born. And when I talk about birth weight EBVs, I like to talk about moderate EBVs. So we don't want really heavy calves. We know there's an association between calving ease and birth weight. And in general, heavier calves are more likely to need assistance at calving. But we also don't need really tiny little calves that are gonna fail to thrive when they're born. And so I guess um, when you're looking at the birth weight EBVs, thinking about moderation and a moderate EBV, not too heavy, but not, not really small calves as well. So the next thing our, our cow needs to do is raise the calf to weaning. And so this is our, our milk EBV. And um, the milk EBV that Breed Plan produces describes the maternal contribution that a cow makes to the 200 day weight of her calf. 
Now, that maternal contribution has a couple of factors. And so we see that the differences in milk EBVs are influenced by a, a few things that that cow does. Firstly, the amount of milk that the calf receives, so the amount of milk that that, that cow's producing, but also the quality of that milk. So um, the amount of fats and things in it like that is going to impact on the calf growth to 200 days. And the last is the mothering ability of the dam. She's got to let that calf drink to be able to pass on the benefit of her milk. And so all of these factors are being described by our milk EBV. Um, and the reason that we calculate it as a, a contribution to 200 day weight is because unlike in the dairy industry, we don't have many beef producers that are out there uh, collecting milk samples on their, their cows. So we don't actually ever have a measure of how much milk they're producing, but we can do it through looking at the maternal contribution to the 200 day weight of the calf. And once again, we want to look at an optimal EBV. So the optimal milk EBV is going to depend on the environment in which you are running your cows. Um, for, for most people, um, I think sitting around an average milk EBV is perfectly acceptable. There are some, some issues with high milk EBV cows in that if you don't have really good feed in front of them, sometimes they can struggle to get back in calf. And so um, that's a, an issue with, with uh, energy partitioning. And so if they don't have adequate feed, and they're putting all of their, their energy into producing milk for their calf, they can sometimes not have en enough energy to get back in, in calf with the, the next joining. And so I think when we're looking at milk, if you're in a, a high feed environment, it's okay to chase high milk. Um, but if you're in an average environment or you don't always have the feed to put in front of those cows, there's nothing wrong with, with having a little bit less milk um, and a, looking for a more average milk EBV and bringing it back. So it's it's really about balancing that that milk EBV with your environment. And I, I guess too, if you're turning off weaners, that's probably when I would pay um, a lot more attention to the milk EBV and, and really look for some high milking cows. But but otherwise, um, yeah, really make sure that you you take a, a that you target your milk EBV to the environment in which those cows are running. So our cow has got in calf, given us a live calf and weaned that calf. And then what she needs to do is get back in calf. But we want her to do all of that without costing a fortune to feed because we know that feed costs are some of the most expensive in a beef operation. And so generally, lighter cows will eat less and therefore they cost less to feed. Whereas heavier cows, they weigh more, they cost more to feed, but they're typically worth more as cull cows. And so it's a real balancing act between weighing up how long is that cow going to be in your herd? How much is she going to cost you to feed over her lifetime versus her value when you go to cull her? And so um, trying to balance those two things to get the optimal outcome for your, your system. So. Our cow maintenance EBV is our mature cow weight EBV, and that's the genetic difference in cow live weight at five years of age. And I think one of the things that I really noticed in the last drought, um, particularly towards the end of 2019, was a, a lot of discussion about where is the optimal mature size. And I think that's, um, probably a little bit different to what we've seen before where people were really talking about the maintenance of their cows and how much it costs to feed them and really starting to think about what is the ideal mature size for the animal that I'm running. So while I don't think anyone has ever suggested that tiny cows are the target, I was listening to a webinar a couple of weeks ago um, with a New South Wales breeder who was talking about how she breeds for efficiency on her property. And to paraphrase her, she said, we're not aiming for elephants. And so I think that's something to keep in mind. We're not looking for really big cows and we're not looking for really small cows. So what we're really essentially after then is a moderate mature cow weight EBV, which allows you to maintain the mature size of your breeding cows, but without compromising the growth in the progeny. 
Another um, way of looking at cow maintenance is feed efficiency on grass. Now, I think with the ongoing feed efficiency research, that's really the holy grail of, of what feed efficiency researchers are after, but we don't have a measure of feed efficiency for individual animals on grass that we can use for genetic evaluation at this stage. But it is something where research is ongoing and I know CSIRO and New South Wales DPI are among those organisations that are working on this. So we're not quite there yet, but hopefully we'll be able to come up with a way to measure feed efficiency of individual animals on grass in the future. We do have two net feed intake EBVs that Breed Plan publishes for some breeds. They are both measures of feed efficiency when animals are in the feedlot, either in a growth phase or a feedlot finishing phase. And while those, those NFI EBVs are collected from the feedlot, research has shown that there is a relationship between the NFI EBVs and feed efficiency or intake in cows. And so if your breed has NFI EBVs available, you can use these as a proxy for feed efficiency in the cow herd. So just to summarise how we improve efficiency in our breeding herd, we want fertile cows, which is our fertility traits. We want live births, which is our calving traits. We want to optimise milk for the environment that you're running your cows in and moderate the mature cow size. And that's our mature cow weight EBV. So that's the cow herd. If we have a look at our sale and slaughter progeny, they've got a couple of jobs. They should reach market specifications, preferably quickly. And they should also do that without consuming excessive amounts of feed. So if we think about reaching market specifications, increasing the number of animals that reach market specs has an obvious impact on the value of those animals as sale animals. And if we think about the cost to produce a high MSA grade carcass, it's quite similar to the cost of producing a poorer one. And so it's much more efficient to be able to turn out high quality product when we're producing these animals. In addition, if we think about the time it takes an animal to reach market spec, if they can reach market specs more quickly, so we're turning off younger animals, that reduces our cost to production. And the other benefit that this has is that it also leads to reduced ossification, which is often beneficial for your market specs. So, Reaching market specifications and doing so as quickly as possible really requires a combination of growth and carcass genetics. If we just take an animal that grows and grows and grows and has high growth and doesn't finish, that's not what we want. But we also don't want the opposite. We don't want an animal that finishes early but doesn't make the target weight for your market specification. So it's about balancing growth in carcass to get the, the target weight in an animal that has been finished sufficiently for market. So if we think about our breed plan weight EBVs, we've got three of those. The first is 200 day growth, and that's really the EBV you should be using if you're looking at vela or wiener production. Our 400 day weight, is the one that I would recommend producers use for yielding production. And 600 day weight is if you're looking at turning off animals at 18 months or greater. They're really the, the three ways I would break down those EBVs. They're all an EBV for growth at a particular time point. Um, and in all cases, we want to be targeting more positive EBVs. So that's giving us more growth at that life stage. We've also got a number of carcass EBVs that we can, uh, that producers can utilise to try and improve their carcass performance. So carcass weight uh, is the weight of the carcass, hot standard carcass weight, and we want to look for more positive EBVs. Eye muscle area or EMA, um, once again, more positive EBVs will give us higher eye muscle area. Ribbon rump fat EBVs are once again one of those optimal EBVs and where you should be targeting really depends on your desired outcome. So if you are finding that your animals are over fat, 
and you're getting penalised because they've got too much fat on them, then I'd be looking for more negative or lower rib and rump fat EBVs because that's taking the fat off. Whereas if you're looking, or if you're finding that your animals aren't making minimal fat requirements for their target markets, looking for more positive rib and rump fat EBVs to put some extra fat on them. So once again, one of those EBVs that really depends on where you're sitting and what the optimal outcome is for your, your target market and your particular cattle. Our other carcass EBVs are retail beef yield. Um, and so in this case, we're looking for more positive EBVs and also intramuscular fat. So this EBV um, is the genetic influence on marble score. And so from a genetic point of view, this is one of the, the things we can influence to try and get increased MSA score. Um, there's obviously a lot of management things that you can do on farm to also improve MSA score, but from a, from a genetic point of view, pushing the IMF is, is one of the things we can do. And in this case, we're looking for more positive EBVs. Now, I just wanted to um, quickly discuss that I think both retail beef yield and IMF are going to be valuable as the beef industry moves to value-based payments. Uh, IMF, because it's one of the genetic influences on MSA, and as we move to carcass yield payments, that's our, our retail beef yield. And so I'm going to talk a little bit um, later about not putting too much emphasis on single trait, but I just wanted to say that if you are targeting MSA um, markets, while IMF is important, just keep an eye on your retail beef field. We know that the relationship between these, these two traits, IMF and retail beef field, is uh, negative. So as IMF goes up, retail beef field tends to decrease. Just keep an eye on retail beef field. You don't want to push MSA, oh, sorry, don't want to push IMF until to the point that you lose your, your yield. So just trying to keep these two balanced as much as possible is what I would recommend producers keep an eye on. So our, our second job for our sale and slaughter progeny is that they don't consume excessive amounts of feed. So we know, as I said earlier with the cows, that feed is a major cost in our beef operations. And if we think about efficiency, if we can produce the same amount of product, so for example, a kilo of beef with less input or less feed, then we've increased our efficiency. And so we have a couple of traits in the breed plan analysis, which are net feed intake traits. And what they are looking at is the difference between what an animal is expected to eat versus what it actually eats. So if we look at those two EBVs, one is net feed intake post weaning. This is when the animals are in a growth phase. And the other is net feed intake feedlot finishing. And this is when they're in a finishing phase. And you'll notice that I've put there that more negative EBVs for NFI are more desirable. And that might seem a little counterintuitive, but if you think about it from the point of view of the trait, net feed intake, then if we think about is an animal eating more than what it would be expected to eat, that's going to be positive. Whereas if it's, expect, if it's eating less than what it's expected to eat, then that's our more feed efficient animal, even though it's got a negative EBV. And so that's why when we're looking at feed intake, we're really looking for those negative EBVs because that's telling us they eat less feed than we would expect them to, to give us the same amount of product. So to summarise efficiency in sale and slaughter progeny, what we're really looking to do is increase the number of animals hitting the targets, and that's our growth and carcass traits, reduce our age to turn off, which is our growth and carcass traits, and also improve feed efficiency, which is our net feed intake traits. And so I'll pause for questions. Naomi, do we have any, any questions that have come through? We haven't had any come through yet but I'll throw it out to the audience if you do have any questions send them through now and you can ask um, but I did just want to see Katrina if you could just touch on a little bit on the genetic correlation between rib and rump fat and IMF because um, it would be a good point to discuss whether or not increasing your rib and rump fat is actually going to lead to an increase in IMF or not. Um, 
They are they are correlated traits. So in general, we expect as rib and rump fat go up, IMF should go up as well. Um, but I certainly wouldn't advocate using rib and rump fat as an indirect method of selecting for intramuscular fat. Um, I'm going to touch on relationships between traits in the next section, but one of the things we'll cover is the fact that even when there are positive relationships between traits, those relationships aren't absolute. So it's not like increasing rib fat by one unit will increase IMF by one unit. So um, yes, while you expect animals with a bit more rib and rump fat to have increased IMF, it won't always be the case. And it's always better to, to select directly for the trait that you're interested in rather than to select for a correlated trait. Yeah, thank you for covering that. Um, we haven't, oh, we've got one question that's come through. Just wondering what breeds have proven to be better vehicles of net feed intake? Uh, so, I guess um, being a SBTS technical officer, we have a, a bit of a policy of not um, uh, promoting one breed over the other. I, I'm a technical officer for six of the breeds in our project and we've got 13 that we look after. Um, I haven't read any of the NFI paper studies on what they've found to be more efficient animals um, in a breed specific way. But I guess I can tell you that at this stage, Angus and Hereford have NFI EBVs um, and most of the other breeds in Australia do not. Um, that's not a reflection on the fact that some of those breeds are more or less um, efficient for NFI. It's just a reflection on the fact that they're very expensive traits to measure. Um, most of our NFI data comes in through progeny test projects, which are run by the society. Um, and to do, to do an NFI trial, we need the animal on feed for 90 days, um, plus an adjustment period while it gets used to the feed that it's being on. And so, um, by the time you've had an animal on feed for, for at least a, a hundred days, um, it gets very, very expensive to do. So yeah, I I really have to look up um, papers in terms of breed specific. I haven't haven't really got any any um, off the top of my head knowledge of, of which one would be more efficient as a breed. And I, I guess I should also add that even while we might see breed differences, there's also going to be variation within that breed. And what we usually see for traits is that quite often the top performing animal in one breed and the bottom performing animal in, in the same breed will overlap with the performance of other breeds, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess as we get to a point where we're able to utilise multi-breed analysis, it's going to become a lot easier to compare across breeds for some of those traits once, as you said, the data is available. Yeah, and I, I guess just bringing that point back to while we do see breeding um, differences, there is a lot of variation within um, individual breeds. I know in the north, which I, I don't do northern stuff, um, our tropical beef technology services staff um, look after the, the tropical breeds, but I know that they've had a multi-breed um, analysis for a couple of those breeds and, and they see exactly that, that when they look at a range of traits, um, there's three breeds in there and they don't see that the top animal for, for one trait is all one breed and then the second breed and then the third breed, they see you know, the top three or four animals will represent all three breeds. So I think multi-breed might, might help us to identify um, the most efficient breeds, reg animals regardless of breed, but I'm, I'm certainly not expecting that we're going to see for most traits, breed one, breed two, breed three, we're going to see some overlap. So we've had um, another couple of questions come in. So how is the influence of a bull's EBVs able to be applied when the cow herd is a crossbred? Uh, so if you, so I guess if you, 
Yep. I was just going to say, so I, I guess we're talking about when you've got um, a hybrid or crossbred animal animals within your cow herd, um, they're just wanting to know how that animal's EBV, that bull's EBV can then be applied to yep. the herd. Yeah, so I guess in that situation, really when you're looking at the EBVs, I haven't said this yet, um, EBVs at the moment should only be compared within a breed. And if you're looking at a sire that you're going to bring in, then where I see EBVs being relevant for that particular, particular scenario is in selecting the sire that you're going to bring in. So if you've got EBVs on all of the bulls of a breed that you're considering, using those EBVs to rank those bulls and get the traits that you're after and then bring them that bull in based on its its EBVs and also um, I'm going to cover animal selection a little bit more but also things like structure is of course important. So use those EBVs to rank your sires and then put them over the, the cow herd so that you know that you're getting um, the best genetics you can in that sires breed. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, we might move on so we can go through and then if anyone has any questions, please feel free to send them through while Katrina's talking and we can cover them um, at the end of her presentation. Okay, so back to looking at efficiency in the whole production system. So just to summarise that again, we've got our breeding herd here. So um, that's our fertile cows with our fertility traits, live births with our calving traits, optimal milk for our environment, and then moderating that mature cow size. Uh, and then in our sale and slaughter progeny, using the growth in carcass traits to increase the number of animals hitting our market targets and also reducing age to turnoff, while also improving feed efficiency, which is our net feed intake traits. So I've just highlighted a whole bunch of different traits and EBVs that are important when we're breeding for production system efficiency. And I guess that brings us into thinking about how much emphasis should we put on each trait? How much emphasis do you put on weight? How much do you put on eye muscle area? How much do you put on IMF? How much do you put on your calving traits? And so what we have done is develop selection indexes. And these take the hard work out of knowing how much emphasis to give to each of these different traits when you're selecting animals to improve herd profitability. So what a selection index does is provide an EBV for profit for a specific production to market scenario. They are reported in dollars um, for that specific production to market scenario. And they also allow herds to make maximum overall genetic progress by balancing the emphasis on each trait. And another advantage of selection indexes is that they really help beef producers to avoid placing too much emphasis on a single trait. So too much emphasis on just a single trait can have some unintended consequences. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, there are relationships between many of the traits that I've been talking about. They're not inherited in isolation. The biological system and often um, some of the the genes that are responsible for one trait also influence another trait. And so the other thing is that while there's lots of relationships between traits, is that not all of those relationships are favourable. So if we think about growth and in, in um, selecting for higher weights, then often if we just did that in isolation or we just put a lot of emphasis on, on growth, then what we would typically see is our birth weight would increase and then because our birth weight's gone up we'd expect our calving ease to decrease and also our mature size, mature cow weight to go up. So one really nice thing is that the relationships between these traits are rarely absolute, they're not one to one. And so what that means is there are animals out there that can allow you to make progress in both traits. And we typically call those animals curve benders. So if we have a look here at bull one, this is a um, EBV percentile graph. I really like them for visualizing where a bull sits relative to the rest of his breed. And so um, if you look along the 
hopefully everyone can see my mouse. If we look along here, this 50, 50th percentile here is the breed average. Now, I took this um, from a 2020 run. You'll note it's the 2018 uh, breed average, and that's because um, on the breed plan analysis, our breed average is always two years previously because um, those 2018 calves are now old enough to have been recorded for all of the, the breed plan traits. But also, if you think about the animals that you've bought this year, typically those young sires will be rising two-year-olds, and so they will be 2018 drop. And so that's why the breed average is always set two years to current date. So breed average is here in the 50th percentile. This gives us each of the traits, and then we can see which way this bull is. So if we look at growth here for his 200, 400, and 600 day weights, we'll see that he's in, I would say, the top 1% of the breed for growth. So he's a really high growth bull. But what we also see is he has a really heavy birth weight. He's in the top 99% of the breed, which is the polite way of saying he's in the bottom 1% of the breed. So he's got a very heavy birth weight and he's also got harder calving for calving his direct and calving his daughters. If we look at his mature cow weight here, we'll see he's also got a really heavy mature cow weight. So that is an example of the classic relationship that we'd see between traits, between growth, birth weight, mature cow weight. Whereas if we look at this bull, he's also got high growth. So he's got a high 200 day weight, 400 day weight and 600 day weight. He's got a moderate birth weight, so his birth weight up here is sitting just, uh, this is breed average here, so he's lighter than breed average. And he's also got easier calving. So those top two yellow bars, he's sitting in the easier end in the top 10% of the breed or higher for calving ease. And moderate mature cow weight. So if we come down and look at the fourth green bar, he's sitting just above breed average so he's slightly heavier than breed average for mature cow weight. So this is a good example of a curve bender where those relationships that we expect between growth, birth weight and mature cow weight have been broken and these are the sort of bulls that can help you make progress in multiple traits without having negative impacts on other traits. But when we're thinking about our curve bender bulls, all of those relevant traits need to be recorded to identify a curve bender. So if you wanna look for curve benders for birth weight, growth and mature cow weight, it's important that birth weights, 200, 400 and 600 day weights and the mature cow weights on the females are recorded. And so my advice to commercial beef producers is that when you're looking for a seed stock producer to source bulls from, it's really important that you try and find a seed stock producer who is recording all of the traits that you're interested in in your own herd so that you know that they've got as much data on those traits as possible and typically if they're recording them they're also of interest to them in their their breeding herd so trying to align what what they're doing and what they're recording with the traits that are important to you. So I just wanted to run through a breed plan guide to animal selection. So Really what we're trying to do here is ensure a balanced selection for traits important to a production system. And so what I recommend people do is identify the selection index of most relevance to your herd. Um, most breed societies will publish a variety of selection indexes. I recommend you go and have a look at the selection indexes for the breed that you're interested in and find that selection index that describes your, your situation. Then you rank animals available for sale using that selection index that you've selected. And then consider individual EBVs of importance. So I've put up three bulls here and we'll see for index A, they've all got the same value. They're $154, which is well above the breed average of $88. Now, while they're both high, or all three of them are high indexing bulls, just because they've got the same index value doesn't mean that they've got the same individual EBV value. And so 
I would look at the traits that are of particular importance so to your to your um, enterprise as you're selecting. So do your initial sort on index and then go through and say, does this bull have the suite of genetics that I want and that I'm interested in, improve, in improving on my, my farm? So for example, if we have a look there, we can see bull A, carving east direct and carving east daughters above breed average. Bull B is below average for carving east direct. Bull C is above average for carving east direct. So there is one bull there that I would not be recommending for use over heifers, and that is bull B. Um, equally, if you go along and have a look at the docility, you'll see that the docility varies. And so there is another bull there with a negative docility score that I would not be recommending if you're concerned about the temperament of your progeny when that bull's born. So while they've all got good index values, they're all profitable bulls, there's some other traits there to think about and think about is this what I want on my property. And then the last thing you need to do is consider other traits of importance. So those include the pedigree. Um, as a commercial producer, think about where you've bought bulls from previously. Are the bulls that you've used closely related uh, are the bulls that you've, you're considering buying closely related to the bulls that you've used previously if you've kept cows out of those bulls? Because then we might start to get into issues where there's some close pedigree. I would recommend that everyone considers the fertility of a bull that they're buying and make sure that it's got bull check data. I'd also think about genetic conditions and horn pole status. Um, the easiest way to manage genetic conditions in your herd is to prevent them from getting in. So I would only be buying a bull if I was a commercial producer out of bull uh, from, I would only be buying bulls that have tested free of known genetic conditions. Structure is obviously really important. Um, it doesn't matter what his EBVs and his indexes are. If he can't walk and he can't serve bulls, he should not be being used sorry, can't serve cows, he should not be being used. And lastly, temperament. So we, I put the docility EBV up before, that's the temperament in the progeny. We want to also assess the temperament of the bull. Is he quiet to handle? Are you going to be able to, to move him around easily on farm, put him out with the, the cows? So it's not just about his breed plan and his genetic EBVs and selection indexes and his genetic package. It's also about all of those other things that make a good bull. So making sure there's, as I said, structure, temperament, free of genetic conditions, passes his bull check fertility examination and his pedigree isn't going to cause inbreeding problems in your herd. An alternative option for commercial herds is to think about doing a terminal sire cross maternal cow cross with different breeds. And the advantage of doing this is that you can concentrate on different traits in the two different um, breeds. So if you think about your maternal cows, you can concentrate there on fertility, calving ease, milk and mature size, and making sure that when you're, you're buying bulls to breed those maternal cows, that they're the EBVs you really focus on. And that allows you to try and moderate your, your growth and your mature size without compromising the growth in the calf. And so when you're looking for your terminal sire, comparing the EBVs in that, in that breed and thinking about growth, carcass and net feed intake where available. And the last thing I wanted to touch on very quickly was breeding for environmental efficiency. So we know that selecting cattle for a reduced environmental environmental footprint is highly similar to breeding more profitable cattle. And I think that's a really good thing to think about. Um, and the reason for this is that as dry matter intake increases, so does the methane emissions put out by the animal. And we see that in this graph here, along the x-axis, we've got dry matter intake um, increasing from zero to 30, and then along the y-axis, methane production. And what you'll note is that positive relationship there, as dry matter intake goes up, methane production goes up. And the reason for that is that 
methane is essentially just wasted energy. So an animal that is able to efficiently convert its dry matter to product is also likely to be the animal that emits the least methane per kilo of production because it's making really efficient use of the energy available to it and not um, emitting it as methane. So breeding for environmental efficiency. Breeding herd efficiency is paramount, just as we were discussing about breeding for production system efficiency. A heifer or cow who fails to calf or who fails to rear a calf to weaning is a drain on resources because what she's essentially doing is consuming your feed and emitting greenhouse gases without producing saleable progeny. Reducing age at calving from three-year-old to two-year-old is also valuable and that's valuable also for production system efficiency because what essentially is happening there is if you reduce your calving down to two-year-old rather than three-year-old, you're getting rid of an extra year where she's not giving you any product but still consuming feed and emitting greenhouse gas. Um, and maintaining a cow herd with moderate mature size helps to reduce feed intake and thus reduce methane emissions and that's because of the relationship we just discussed about dry matter intake is in, uh, increased dry matter intake is in, associated with increased methane. Faster age to turn off of sale and slaughter progeny is also important. So getting them out younger reduces the amount of feed required over the animal's lifetime which reduces the amount of methane emitted because that animal's younger when it's marketed. And we can also improve that efficiency by getting a high specification carcass because there's a similar emissions profile between a high and a low spec carcass. So just to acknowledge that while I'm obviously here to talk to you about genetics, it's only one of the, the solutions to making um, Australian beef more environmentally efficient. I'm not a climate scientist, so I'm not going to go into any of the other details about how that might happen, just to say that obviously genetics is one tool. There's a whole bunch of other tools and production uh, ways that you manage things on farm that also has an impact. So to summarise, um, profit equals the number of calves, which is our fertility and calving traits, by their weight, which is our growth traits, by the quality, which is our carcass traits, less the cost of production, which is our uh, mature cow weight and efficiency traits. So in the breeding herd, what we're really looking for is fertile cows that get pregnant, preferably in that first or second cycle, they give birth to a live calf, they have optimal milk for their environment to help them raise that calf to weaning, and they're a moderate cow size, so they're not eating lots and lots of feed and not making efficient use of the feed. And then in our sale and slaughter progeny, we're looking for increased number of animals hitting targets, reducing that age to turn off and improved feed efficiency. When you're thinking about animals to buy, I recommend you use selection indexes. They provide you an EBV for profit and allow you to maximise your overall genetic progress by balancing traits and avoid putting too much emphasis on any single trait because as we've seen, if you do that, you can often get adverse effects that are associated with putting too much emphasis on that one trait. Um, breed plan information needs to be used in conjunction with visual assessment. It's not all about his EBVs, it's also about whether or not he's up to do the, the job for you structurally. And remember, breeding for production system efficiency is highly similar to breeding for environmental efficiency. And just to bring it back to this herd rebuild phase that we're in, I would recommend that you keep production system efficiency in mind as you're rebuilding your herd numbers. So at the moment, as you're rebuilding, really good opportunity to reevaluate your breeding direction and your target market. So think about where can you improve in your own operation and which bulls can you source to help you do so. And I guess too, if you've gone out and bought cows and you think, yep, that was all that was available, but I don't really want to keep replacements from them. Consider using a terminal sire across them because then you can market all of their progeny um, for and increase the likelihood of them hitting those, those terminal traits that you, you're after. 
So lastly, to find more information on Breplan, um, you can visit the Breplan website. We have a help centre and there you will find tip sheets on understanding EBVs and selection indexes, both the SPTS and the TBTS websites. We have um, sections for seed stock and commercial producers. And lastly, the MLA genetics resources. Um, these are commercial producer focused. You'll find a, a range of case studies and short videos outlining um, how to use breed plan information in selection decisions and case studies of people who have done that to improve um, performance in their own herds. And there's a link there for both temperate cattle and tropical cattle. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Katrina, I think that's been a really good summary of um, what those EBVs are and how we can utilise them within our herd, particularly within a commercial herd. Um, we have yep. had a comment come through from a producer and his comment is, as a weaner producer, he'll use a 200-day weight gain EBV. However, the market these weaners are going to will possibly be looking at a 400-day um, EBV weight gain. And I guess the question that I've pulled from that is, do you think buyers of weaners and feeder stock are interested in the EBVs of the bulls that have produced those progeny or are they primarily a tool for the breeder so that they can get the benefit from them? Um, I guess that's going to vary but while they may not be interested in the EBV per se, I think the buyers are probably interested in the performance of those animals and that's indirectly interested then in the genetics of that animal. So while I'm not sure that they would necessarily go out and say what are the genetics of, of the size that you've used, they'd certainly be interested in are your, your animals going to be, be able to perform when we bring them in and my understanding is that feedlotters have a pretty good idea of whose cattle perform and whose cattle don't, whether or not yeah, that's... Definitely, yeah, yeah, it definitely comes back to um, having preferred buyers that they are looking at and su yeah. preferred suppliers I think. Um, I'll just throw it out there if anyone else has any other questions coming through. Um, I guess in, in summary, some of the things, I guess a drought has really highlighted that economic cost of carrying big cows. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit on, if you can talk a little bit about um, just how that cow body size, or I guess my comment on that is that the cow body size and weight doesn't influence their energy use efficiency which goes back to that net feed intake but it will dictate how much energy they require for maintenance and production so are you seeing people starting to really drill down on some of these EBVs from your conversations with producers about trying to look at those really critical cow size EBVs and bring them back to a more moderate animal to improve that efficiency on the back of the drought? Yeah, um, I, I think there's been a lot more conversation than we'd had had than I'd ever experienced previously about um, mature cow size and you know bringing them back from a, a really large mature size to a more moderate size. Um, and I guess previously that wasn't necessarily something that a number of producers were interested in, but I'm I'm certainly hearing more discussion about the benefit of moderate mature size and bringing them back um, as a result of, of the drought. I think it's it's been a topic I've heard a lot about in the last, well, probably 12 months of, of last year and a little bit this year. Um, and I think what it comes back to is that traditionally, we probably haven't really counted the cost of grass because grass is just something that grows in the paddock, whereas the drought and the lack of pasture has really highlighted the cost of, of grass and the cost of, of feeding cows. Yeah, it certainly has that forage budget and the cost of what those cows are eating is something that we're seeing from our end as well. Um, yep. We've got one more question that's come through here and this is from someone that answered no knowledge. So it's great to have you on here. Um, to get some knowledge about EBVs. And her question was, where do we where do we refer to for the measurements required to be taken um, to record EBVs? And yep. in some cases, how do we take those measurements? Yep, um, great question. I am going to direct you to the Breed Plan website and the Help Centre. Um, 
if you go to the help centre and just search for recording um, the traits you're interested in, you will find some tip sheets. And we have also spent part of this year with the COVID lockdown, um, developing some how to record videos for the traits. So if you go to the Breed Plan website and have a look there, you'll also find those short videos. Most of them are under five minutes in length. Um, and they're also available via the SBTS and TBTS YouTube channel. Yep, fantastic. And they are really great, easy to use and read resources. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions there at the moment. So I think we're pretty close to our time now. So we might finish there. And if anyone that's on with us at the moment does have any questions or thinks of anything after, please feel free to send those through and we'll make sure to answer those for you. And thank you very much for your time, Katrina. This has been really, really valuable. I've certainly got a lot from it myself. So we'll just quickly do these last couple of questions. Um, so the first one, I'll just change this back to my screen. So the first question is going to be, how would you now rate your knowledge of EBVs? Um, so after what Katrina's gone through there, do you feel like your knowledge has improved from when you answered this morning? And one. Um, and I can definitely see that we've had a jump here, which is really fantastic. Um, and it looks like particularly those that have been for minimal or no knowledge, they've certainly picked something up today, which is really good. And we've got one more question. If you just give me a second. Um, and this is for us with the local land services is, what topics would you like to see us cover in the future? Um, we're always looking for your feedback on what's gonna be relevant to you. And you can select multiple options with this question as well. I see lots of answers coming in there. Just give this another couple of seconds because it is a, mult, a multiple option answer. And so we're gonna close that in three, two, and one. And we'll share those results. Um, so a bit of a mix of everything, which is fantastic. And it looks like beef nutrition and grazing management um, is a really popular one, which is really good because I'm going to bring in Kate McCarthy now to let you know about what we'll be running next as part of the Beef Extension Network. Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, I apologise in advance. I'm in a really high traffic area. Um, just today, so um, apologies for the background noise. But um, firstly, just like to say, fantastic webinar, um, Katrina. I found it really informative, and, and if not now, like this is a perfect time to be talking about genetics and what we can be looking at to really, you know, hone in on our our genetic targets and our performance targets. So um, that's fantastic. And another thing I'll probably say is, yeah, like. Uh, Katrina's highlighted a, a number of EBVs that you can be looking at and concentrating on. Um, but make, yeah, I, I mean, Katrina could say otherwise, but one thing is hone down on your goals and really focus on what your target is over the next, you know, your succession of your enterprise. And because um, it can be overwhelming with the number of EBVs that are available. And um, from a nutrition perspective, I'm really excited about the work done for feed conversion efficiency. So, um, yeah, fantastic job, Naomi and um, Katrina. And so what I'm going to talk about is our, our next webinar. And on the note of everyone being excited about nutrition, um, we're going to have a nutrition webinar um, around uh, uh, sum up over the summer period. So what should we be thinking about in regards to nutrition in the summer period? And um, it's a tricky time because, you know, as feed dries off and but we also come into our peak season for tropical grasses. So we're going to talk about what should we be thinking about in regards to um, our protein supplementation on drier feed. Um, what should we think about with tropicals um, as we've seen we're coming into a may or may not continue to rain so what do we do if it doesn't rain and, and what do we do if it does rain from a nutrition perspective and we have that that excessive amount of a bulk green feed and um, not necessarily enough stock to graze it so what's the best options there 
Um, so our webinar will be on Wednesday the 18th of November from 1 to 2 p.m. There'll be myself um, with a, a strong interest in nutrition. Um, there'll be Sue Street. Uh, she's actually completed a PhD um, in, in nutrition around a fiver. So she'll be joining in from Central West. Um, and you've got Brett Littler, who's also a senior land service officer um, with a very um, extended knowledge in nutrition, um, if you're not already aware of it. So um, please, yeah, if you have a, like you've showcased an interest in nutrition, please jump in and um, listen to our webinar. And, and yeah, thanks for listening in today as well. Thanks, Kate. That's going to be a that's going to be a really good good um, webinar, and it's the same process to register for that one as it was for this one. So that's that's us for today. Um, we will be sending around a copy of this recording. If you have any questions, please get in touch. And thanks again to Katrina.